This here behind me is the refreshed Skoda Kodiak, and I have to admit here something. I was wrong about it in the past. This episode is brought to you by Carvago. Be smart. Choose your car online with Carvago. Before I get to the actual review, I'd like to relate to my pre-facelift Kodiak review from five years ago. If you're not interested, just skip to the next chapter on the progress bar here. Now, I often look back and re-watch my older reviews to remind myself what I said, what I noticed, and whether or not something changed about what I said. And usually, looking back at such reviews, I feel I stand by what I said. And sometimes, I even see certain things mentioned, and probably later customers also mentioned, uh, being addressed in the model updates. However, having watched my 2017 Kodiak review, I started wondering what annoyed me so much about that car. Was it to do with the decorative elements on the gear selector being plastic and not ceramic like in the BMW iDrive selector at the time? Was it the fact the umbrella holders in the doors were not heated like in a Rolls Royce? Was it the pricing which placed the test car close to the base spec Land Rover Discovery Sport or the BMW X3? I still stand by my other strong and weak points, but I have no idea what came over me, even though I was trying to show the Kodiak offered more than some of the more expensive competitors, I was still hitting it with a hammer. And it wasn't a matter of moderately comfortable road trip, the right seat was terrible by the way, and the lane keeping assist was way over zealous, it must have been my inflated expectations crashing against the grey quartz metallic reality. No, it's not Skoda's fault. Sometimes I just expect so much from a car and some cars I just are just hyped so much that it's easy to pop that balloon of enthusiasm into oblivion and that's what happened to me in the Kodiak. Okay, sorry for the self-critical longish intro, now let's get on with the review. The Skoda Kodiak debuted in autumn 2016. I remember waiting for the SUV, meanwhile there were delays as the factory couldn't keep up with demand. If a dealership door wasn't properly shut, a client would bust in asking everyone to shut the cuff up and take his money for the Kodiak. Sounds familiar? I even recall Skoda was nice enough to me to release the already delayed press car a few hours earlier by foregoing some procedures. I came to collect what I expected to be an epiphany and I saw a grey box which may have been the size of the Kodiak bear, but I think the bear looks much nicer. After the facelift you can scare children with the Kodiak, but I guess you're not buying this car for its gorgeous proportions, which they're not, but for the interior space in this case it is a 7-seater. The third row costs some 60 liters of boot capacity, that's 765 liters with the third row of seats folded. I'm not sure how Skoda came up with that number as the previous 5-seater had just 720 liters boot capacity, while the current 5-seater Kodiak has 835 liters. Quick measurements seem to indicate Skoda is quite liberal with the rear seat position, which not only has adjustable backrest angle but also slides for more space and easier access to the third row. But first, let's get those seats out. It's as simple as pulling a couple of straps, getting the headrests up. By the way, if you want to fold them, there is a lever here, so just fold them like this. Now, behind the seats you get 270 liters, and I'm ready to believe this. This is on par with the Toyota Highlander. There are some shopping bag hooks, a 12-volt socket, the cargo cover fits under the floor, and there is still some space for your dirty running shoes, just don't forget to take them out. The electrically operated tailgate can be closed with the remote control key, gesture or with a button on the tailgate itself, but you don't have a separate button to lock the car. By the way, if you're looking for a car with a huge boot and sooner than Skoda can produce one for you at the moment, check out Carvago. Looking for a car for family, fun or work? Carvago.com is the place for you. Carvago is a modern platform with vetted cars from all over Europe. You can buy a car from the comfort of your home and Carvago will deliver it to your doorstep. 
Carvago.com features more than 700,000 cars from vetted dealers across Europe. You select a car on Carvago. Carvago sends out its experts and presents you with Car Audit, a full report on the actual condition of the car. Car Audit keeps track of 270 technical points, includes photos as well as final evaluation by a Carvago certified technician. Next, you simply select financing and delivery options, you sign a deal with Carvago, and Carvago buys the vetted car for you. You have 14 days after delivery to test drive and return the car without giving a reason. The price also includes up to 12 months warranty depending on the region. So, what's your car from Carvago going to be like? Now, as for the third row, this is no Peugeot 5008, which has hard to clean floor, but otherwise probably has the best third row space in this price and size range. Sure, there is more space in the Toyota Highlander, but the price is also quite high. On the left, there is a cup holder and on the right, there is a cubby. Not much else is happening here. This is more or less as tight and un as unpleasant as the Land Rover Discovery Sport or the VW Tiguan Allspace. The third row, in case of these cars, is for emergency solution only and only for the kids you really don't like. It's much more comfortable in the second row, you can adjust the backrest angle and you can slide the seats. It's a shame the standard Isofix mounting points are only in the second row. You have to pay 50 euro extra for the front seat Isofix and that's even in this Lauren Clement version. The backrest splits 40-20-40, there are cup holders in the armrest as well as large door pockets. Three zone climate control is an option even here and so are the side heated seats. You can have USB ports and a 230 volt socket instead of the 12 volt socket, but that's an option as well. The doors cover the sills and there is also this optional retractable door edge protector thing, but it puts so much resistance, you have to slam the doors like in the 1990s late Friday shift favorite. The biggest changes are in the front. Of course, there is the virtual instrument cluster, which, depending on the market, may be optional or standard on higher trim versions. Another important change is the introduction of the ergonomic seats. These here are not the ergo seats, but they are quite comfortable as well. This may also depend on the market and the trim. These seats here are heated and ventilated, despite not being the ergo seats. As far as practicality goes, there are decent sized door pockets and a cubby over the driver's left knee, a smartphone cradle with wireless charger at the bottom of the center console, an armrest with adjustment in two directions, and underneath it a cubby with removable, rather small cup holders. There are two glove boxes, the lower one is ventilated and with place where the CD player once was. Speaking of media, this car gets the optional Columbus infotainment system with a 9.2 inch display. Good infotainment systems in the VW group ended around the Mark 7 Golf, in my opinion, and it's been downhill from there. In theory, you can customize everything, but in real life it's better to use Android Auto or Apple CarPlay because the customizing everything takes long and then you find out not everything is possible. For example, long-term fuel economy, cannot be displayed for some reason, I don't even know how to find it, bloody hell, cannot somehow be displayed on the virtual instrument cluster, I don't know, I only managed to get since start fuel economy there, I searched the owner manual but to no avail. And after a longer stop the infotainment system takes ages to load and sometimes it lags and sometimes the wireless Android auto connectivity can be patchy and in order to change anything you just have to focus on the screen and take your eyes off the road for so long, you better rely on the driver assist systems to keep you driving straight. And more about that in a moment when we hit the road. On, please. So, driver aids. The facelifted Kodiak has more advanced driver aids, obviously. I noticed the adaptive cruise control now works with Google Maps as well as with the onboard satnav, and it will slow down before your next maneuver so you don't miss that motorway exit. Lane keeping assist stopped alerting me to keep my hands on the wheel all the time while on dual carriageways, but the lane departure warning became overzealous on regular roads. And I haven't found sensitivity settings anywhere. However, the lane keeping assist works too late for the amount of time you spend with your eyes on the screen. 
I don't know how is that possible that the VW group with billions for R&D got caught cheating on emissions like some elementary school kid. And it doesn't seem to have enough resources to get decent programmers to do the driver aids properly. Unless it's a way of keeping Skoda in its place below VW and Audi. Perhaps driver aids wouldn't be that much of a problem if the steering wasn't as light However, it still is. Also, it seems like something changed with the steering ratio. I don't remember it being quite as direct. And progressive steering is reserved for the Sportline and RS models. Manual gearbox change is reserved for the basic petrol motor, while everything else has DSG. According to Skoda, 92% of Kodiaks sold globally were with DSG. Also, most Kodiaks sold were diesel, albeit the proportion difference wasn't quite as big. And speaking of engines, the lineup is as follows. The 1.5 liter TSI 150 horsepower front wheel drive manual or DSG, 2 liter TSI front wheel drive or all wheel drive, DSG obviously, 190 horsepower or 245 horsepower in the RS variant. And the 2 liter diesel 150 or 200 horsepower, both DSG, the former can be had with front wheel drive. And this is the powertrain option on this test car. Skoda claims this car will do 0 to 100 km per hour in 9.8 seconds in the 7-seater spec. Even in sport mode, I was almost a second slower. Claimed fuel economy is 6 liters per 100 km combined. Very optimistic, in real life it's more like 7, and that's if you're careful. Soundproofing. In the pre-facelift Kodiak, at least in the early production examples, there was no optional acoustic front side windows. The facelifted car has those as standard or as an option depending on a spec. It's an option well worth choosing in any car and I cannot recommend it highly enough. The only potentially unpleasant sound is the engine rattling at around 70 km per hour, that's the diesel of course, otherwise it's pretty quiet inside. It's also quiet because Skoda got rid of the voice amplifier. It was supposed to help passengers in the front better communicate with passengers in the back. However, you just got an echo effect whenever someone started speaking. Acoustic windows is the better choice. I apologize, I didn't record Matrix LEDs in action at night. Two things. One, it's late spring and the day is long. And since I wake up at 4 a.m. to film, I usually go to bed early when it's still light outside. Two, I tried recording Matrix LEDs doing their thing a couple of times and although I know what I'm watching, I noticed many viewers have no idea what they should be looking for. Long story short, if you drive a lot after dark, get the best lights you can afford. Matrix LEDs are a good option. So, I drove the Kodiak for a while, I listened to some podcasts, I looked at the countryside and I yawned. <sighs> A couple of times and then I put on the ventilated seats because it was, it was quite warm outside actually. <clears throat> I wish the cup holders were a bit bigger because reaching down to the door pocket to get my water bottle is a bit tedious. Some Kodiak trivia. Skoda sold more than 600,000 units of the pre-facelift Kodiak, more than half in Czechia and a quarter in China and over 80,000 units in Russia. The most popular trim variants are style, ambition and sport. Almost half of all Kodiaks sold are either black, grey or white. Prices of the refreshed Skoda Kodiak started €31,990 for the very basic front-wheel drive 1.5 TSI manual active trim model. About 2.5k gets you ambition trim, add €2,000 more for a DSG car and another three for a diesel. The RS starts at 51,100. This front-wheel drive 150 horsepower diesel Lauren and Clement test car starts at 44,350 euro, but with options, it goes up to about 53,400 euro. Popularity of the Skoda Kodiak doesn't come from the fact this is a breakthrough model. It's just a lot of car at a reasonable price for the people who are not necessarily interested in cars, which is probably majority of people, so their needs have to be addressed, right? And what do you think about the Skoda Kodiak? Let me know in the comment section below. If you like my sarcastic, down-to-earth and possibly mildly amusing car reviews, join me every Friday at 3 p.m. Central European time and don't forget to subscribe and like this video as it helps me with the YouTube algorithm. 
thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.